Uh, well, thank you. It's uh, great to be here at the conference for the past two days. It's my first PyCon. Uh, I think I learned a lot of things, uh, got inspired by a number of things. And uh, in fact, I you know, made some changes to my slides <laughs> based on some of the things that I learned. Uh, so just an introduction to Python and Houdini, what this talk is all about. Um, so I've been using Python for maybe three years, but I won't consider myself an expert Python user. Um, neither am I an expert Houdini user, but I figured out when I put both of these subject matters together, I actually have something to talk about and get like maybe 15 or 20 people to sit down in a room and actually listen to me. <laughs> um, so what today's session is really about is, um, what I'll do is I'll attempt to walk you through uh, you know, some of the th ways in which Python is being used in Houdini. Uh, and it's not meant to you know, show you extremely advanced stuff. Uh, it's just meant to get you inspired about the things that, that's happening and the things that's uh, going on, especially with Python and, and software packages like Houdini, for example, say. Um, just a, one a quick raise of hands. Has anyone used Houdini before in this room? Open it up. Uh, no. Oh, sure. <laughs> of course, Tommy. <laughs> uh, uh, so how, um, how many of you uh, are just here because you thought, hey, this, this talk sounds cool and I really want to find out a little bit more. Just, just raise your hands. OK, great. So I just want to get a sense of, of who my audiences are. You know, just in case all of you are Houdini experts, then, then maybe I would just <laughs> say, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is the slide that I'm most embarrassed about. But uh, I realize, oh, sorry. Uh, the next one, I'll just talk about myself uh, very briefly. Uh, Santil has already uh, um, introduced me. Uh, I work with Industrial Light and Magic, so we do like a movie visual effects work. And uh, I've been a Python user for about three years, uh, and a Houdini dabbler of all sorts in my spare time. So today, when, as I talk about Houdini, I'm representing myself as a Houdini and a Python dabbler in this talk, and hopefully that'll get you inspired a bit. And if you have uh, questions, feel free to email me at my email address over there, or if you have job opportunities. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> So first thing, Houdini. What is Houdini? Uh, just a quick introduction to Houdini. Right now, it uh, is at version 12.0. It is a software written by a company called SideEffects.com. It's a procedural method of doing computer graphics where everything is a node. Uh, for some of you who might have been familiar with other software packages like Nuke, Shake, these are compositing packages. They are also node-based. Uh, or Katana, which is a lighting package that is node-based. There seems to be a, a shift towards a nodal-based approach in terms of using software packages. So it's not typically like Maya, where it tends to be a timeline-based sort of thing. It's also, node it's also a little node-based. There you go. Maya expert over there. Um, so basically what it really is, is, is Kata uh, Houdini, you, you can see it as a, a nodal approach of manipulating points. So if I feed it a bunch of points uh, in a 3D space, I feed it into a node, and I can use this node to manipulate where these points go, uh, whether put it through a simulation or, or, or do anything to it. You know? So think of it that way, and that might help a little bit. Uh, it's often used in creating visual uh, effects simulations because this nodal base approach is, is, is very suitable for that. Uh, I'm just ripping off a few slides from the side if, uh, images from the side effects website. Um, so with Houdini 12, they have integrated uh, Bullet, the Bullet physics solver in there. So it's really good at doing like uh, simulations for uh, things like rigid body sims. Uh, this is also from the side effects website. This is probably the first time you're seeing the interface of Houdini. Uh, and it is used for water simulations. This is Houdini 12 flip fluid water simulations. Um, so just some nice things. 
Python and Houdini. So this is why this talk is here. <laughs> uh, Houdini has Python 2.6 integrated into it, uh, much like I think Maya as well. Uh, Python is quickly becoming the de facto choice of scripting language in many CG software. Um, like Maya, Mel uh, also has a Python uh, integration into it. Houdini uses HScript, Houdini script, but at the same time it's also implemented uh, Python as you know, sort of almost becoming a replacement to HScript. Uh, Python was integrated in Houdini from version 9 onwards and you can see that it has a deeper integration with each iteration of Houdini. At this point in time, uh, like shelf tools in Houdini are done with uh, Python. Uh, Houdini has an Amazon cloud rendering solution which is entirely written in Python. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Houdini has its own help web server uh, which is also written in Python. So they are major Python users and in fact when they tried to implement Python uh, in place of HScript they didn't just try to um, replace every single existing HScript function with a Python function but they tried to make it Pythonic as, as much as possible which is also part of the reason why it's a bit slower. <laughs> uh, I mean slower at uh, replacing all of HScript's existing functions and a whole bunch of stuff including motion effects, generating default tools just want to touch quickly. So uh, when to use Python in Houdini? Um, in Houdini there are several ways to write expressions to manipulate points and etc. Uh, there is HScript which I mentioned, uh, there, is in, uh, there is VEX and there is even C++. You can write plugins in the Houdini software development kit with C++. Uh, VEX is a very interesting high performance expression language very efficient giving uh, performance close to compiled C or C++ code. Uh, in Houdini itself when you're using VEX it's pretty much like you're connecting VEX nodes together so it's like a nodal approach to programming even so it's kind of interesting as well. Um, but all these different ways of writing expressions have uh, have their own purpose in Houdini and so it's important to know when to use Python. Python's role is complementary to the various other methods in Houdini. In most cases it replaces HScript, Houdini script and it's preferably used where there is no uh, vex or nodes where you can start with to do what you want to do and it's a, Python is a very good and open way to, to try and implement solutions, test things out, prototype, uh, you can write it really fast. It doesn't have to be, uh, uh, it doesn't have to perform very fast manipulating like 10 million points. Uh, but if you just wanted to test it out on like 100 points and test if your algorithm works, if, if your solution works before you try and write it in C++ or something more efficient or maybe even, uh, you know, try a, a bunch of other stuff, you know, it's really, really uh, helpful. So uh, Houdini and the Python shell and its parameter expression. So, you know, we've talked so much about Houdini, but I think the best way to really show you Houdini is to just delve right into it. So I'm just going to try to get in right now and hopefully I can um, do this whole um, look. I'm facing you, but looking at the screen. Yeah, you're going to have a pain in the neck, but there's no other way. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to launch uh, Houdini. The first thing Nelson, what is Houdini used for? Uh, Houdini is used in the FX uh, industry for, um, for example, smoke simulations, uh, fire explosions, particle simulations, uh, rigid body, uh, soft body, cloth kind of simulations. A lot of uh, that kind of stuff is, is very good in Houdini, although it's also been used to do uh, modeling and lighting tasks. So, yeah. Uh, so, trying to find my orientation here. <laughs> okay. So, first thing I would do is um, if I click this little arrow button and I split the plane, you know, uh, I would say maybe 
top and bottom, maybe? Probably. Uh, all right, so let me just quickly bring up, if I hit the plus tab here, next paint tab type, you can come down and there's a Python shell here. Um, so it's just like, you know, any typical Python shell that you have. Um, over here on this side, how did that switch over? Okay. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come here to the network graph. I'm just going to tab and uh, I'm putting down a geometry. Um, it's okay if you don't understand this part yet. Um, but let's say I put down a grid and this is just going to put down a, a 10 by 10 grid on uh, my screen. If you can see it. <laughs> All right. So this is the first node that I'm putting down. The second node I'm going to put down is I'm going to do a simple mountain node. They're just going to connect both of them together. And if you, in Houdini, there's this way where you can say, click here and display and render. So once I click here and display and render, you can see that my, my grid has now got like a noise pattern to it. And so you can think of it, the, the mountain node manipulates these points, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, so how this, uh, in, in, in Houdini, the Python shell is really intuitive. For example, say if I wanted to find out how to access the mountain node, all I need to do is click the mountain node, drag, and drop it in here. And there you go. So sometimes I wish that when, you know, I had such easy intuitiveness in my Python interactive shell too. Uh, so I just assigned this mountain node to A, for example, say. And now it has a help assist type, which is really cool. A dot, and then there you go. Yeah. Bring down a whole bunch of um, stuff that you want to find out about this node. And maybe you want to find out what the name is. It's mountain one. Uh, you want to find out what is the path of this node. And very interesting, it's got a very Linux-like path. Slash, it's in the object, geo one, mountain one. So if you, if you take a look at it, it's, it's embedded in there. So under object, if you double click geo one, mountain one is in there. So you got some pretty interesting features there. In fact, if you wanted to change, for example, the, the height or the roughness of, of the mountain node programmatically in the shell, you can just right left click roughness, drop it in here. And it actually gives you um, like the path to this parameter, which it calls a who.palm mountain one rough. And right now it's uh, 0 0.6. If I wanted to set it to 1.0, I could do that. And you can see that it's a little more rough now. Right. So these are just you know, simple things that you can do with how Houdini is being integrated um, into here. Uh, the other thing you might want to do is there's this thing called frequency. As you move, as I move, try and move frequency around. Uh, hopefully, you can see this. I'm sorry, this is height. As I move, try and move frequency around. You see my my little grid is now sort of moving up and down. So how do I, how would I maybe animate this frequency? Um, by default, here, uh, let me try and use um, Python in, in the parameter expressions here. By default, it's still using HScript, unfortunately, but you can switch it to Python <laughs> if you wanted to. Uh, Houdini has a uh, who, typically you call a, the who module is where everything is. Uh, you can do a who frame and it's 
going to start animating it. So it's too fast. I don't like it. It's too fast, right? So then just multiply it by 0.1, for example, say. And you can just copy these into each one of the x, y, z. So it does that. If it's still too fast, attempt to make it slower. There you go. All right. And of course, this is not playing back at 24 frames per second, so it's a bit it looks a bit real jittery and fast. So this is now I have animated the grid with Python. And uh, the cool thing here is that you know, who wants to type who dot something? all the time. So uh, side effects has made it really easy. You, it's almost as if they did a from who import star. <laughs> so you, you, you don't need this if you don't want it. And it will still work. Right. So you know, this are just simple stuff. Can you like put a function in the, in, instead of the, the value over there? Yes, you can. So moving on, let me take, let me show you something more, a little bit more interesting, just a little bit. Can't show you all the interesting stuff at once. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, where's my slides? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, the next thing I wanted to show you is 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 this thing called who. Who dot session? Who dot session? Um, so you can't store functions, right? In 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 the interact in the Python shell. So what do you do if you wanted to define functions? For example, say you could store them in the who dot session. Uh, this place is great for prototyping, testing things out, but it only exists uh, in that particular file, uh, that particular sh scene, uh, Houdini scene. Uh, one of the things I could do here is instead of doing a grid now, let me just delete this and I'll show you. Um, I'll just do a box and then I'll put down a node called ISO offset. It's okay if you Guys, I'll try to explain what these nodes do, but this is not a session where I explain what Houdini does more than how Python is used in Houdini. So I've got a I got a box and say I set it to five five five. So my box has gotten a lot bigger. And what this ISO offset does is it creates a volume inside this box. And why am I doing that? It's because I want to populate points in this in this volume. And I use a scatter node. And this scatter node is now going to scatter 5,000 points inside this, this cube. Uh -huh. So 5,000 5, points. I mean, well, let's put 1,000. And uh, now let's come to Windows. You have a Python source editor. So it's a who dot session module. And in here you could basically define um, whatever you want. So I could say um, define um, for example print point. Sorry. Print point. Give me a point, and or sorry, print points. Give me the self. 
uh, give me an object, maybe just the geometry. And I can do something like for point in geo dot points print point position. I'm sorry. I believe point is some sort of keyword in Houdini, so I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, so all I need to do is I need to feed this function print points, uh, an object called geometry. And in there, what it will do is it will print um, the position of these 5,000 points. So what I do here is b, maybe, b equals to just drag and drop this. So I get um, b now refers to my scatter node. And in my scatter node, I believe I can do this geometry, right? So it gives me the geometry. And honestly, in this geometry, you can actually define all the there are points in there. All the points are in there. So if I, sorry. Probably yeah, small letter p points. So all, it's got all the points in there. If I wanted to print out the position, all I needed to do is call who dot session and dot print. Um, not sure if you can see here. It's sort of. Sorry. <laughs> print points, and then I will just feed b dot geometry in there, hit, hit, hit enter, oh, sorry. Capital G. And the screen is making it hard for me to see anything. session dot print points okay. b dot geometry attribute error oh sorry it's my mistake I need to apply this <laughs> <laughs> And there you go, it's printing all 5,000 points coordinates. Uh, so that's if you have uh, functions that you want to use. But again, all of this is, is, is pretty boring stuff. So let me try and delve straight into what I thought was more interesting. Uh, okay, check the time. OK, just quickly, one more real simple example. Um, the other way uh, Python is being used is in these shelf tabs. Each of the buttons, when you click down, when you click a tube, how it lays down the tube, uh, it's all in here. It's all Python. So if you wanted to create your own uh, shelf, you could very easily just plus new shelf. Just create, you know, shelf one, new shelf. You know, I'm not going to be creative here, except I got a new shelf, right click, new tool. And what's my new tool going to do? Uh, Cost the canonical hello world. Where I can type who.ui.display message hello world. And all this will do is it'll just bring out a dialog box. Apply. Hit accept. And now I have a hello world um, button here, which when clicked just gives me this. Um, 
But this is useful in, in a lot of ways because in Houdini, when you lay down a lot of nodes or a network of nodes, sometimes you need Python to reconstruct this network of nodes that you are using. So um, it's helpful. Or you can imagine that it, in, in big studios, for example, it will often be used to, for example, say if you want to save a file but you need to save it a, a, in a certain format, uh, you could easily click this, bring up Qt, some sort of Qt interface, and, and um, be able to um, reformat your file, how you want to save it, or bring up some other um, Qt application that you have. So that's it. The last thing that I want to show you guys is This is the where is the interesting stuff that I want to show. Yep. The, la the most interesting thing about Houdini is this idea of a digital asset. Now remember uh, you saw the mountain node, and that's something that side effects has already done for us. Um, but if you wanted to implement your own mountain node in Python, for example, and, or any other thing. Uh, you could do it with Houdini Digital Assets um, and then you could easily distribute it to other artists as well, which is really cool. Uh, the example that I'm going to show right now is, is this example of, has anyone heard of, heard of Boyd's? It's a 1986 SIGGRAPH paper by, uh, what is it? I think it's Reynold Craig's or something. Uh, it's about flocking behavior. Uh, programming uh, flocking behavior of birds or fish and they uh, basically there are three rules to it uh, the first is that they tend to move towards the center of mass of, of its neighboring um, voids and it tends to have the same average velocity and they will re repel from each other if they get too close so yeah, I'm not so familiar about the chaos theory, but what I'm trying to do here is, uh, as a simple, uh, well, as a quick example, uh, which I will cheat a bit and, and p copy and paste a bunch of code in there, <laughs> uh, is to implement a Boyd uh, node in, in Houdini using Python, of course. So just click new, yes, discard and new. And, uh, same here, I'm just going to put in a geometry node, Let's delete this, and in the geometry node, I'm going to put a, um, a box again, uh, almost very similar setup so that I can start off with a bunch of points. So right now I have a bunch of points here, probably too many points. <laughs> so I'll reduce it to 100. And uh, what I want to do is I want, uh, now that I have a set of points, I want to you know, feed these points through some sort of a uh, Python node that does the whole Boyd's behavior. So I can come to here, if you go to File, New Operator Type, uh, you can call it Boyd's 1. Make sure it's a Python type. And, uh, well, ignore the details on this. We, this is just to make sure it, it's able to operate in this context. Um, what is the file name? This is where it gets saved. So, call it like Boyd's 1 and then accept. And over here, it will you know, do some basic things, which is uh, tell you how, m what, how many inputs you can have, um, what the parameters, and the code. This is where, when, when the node comes down, they, they, they have this idea that it's, it's being cooked. When it's being cooked, this is where the code gets executed here. Right. So this is where we want to put our, our code for the Boyd's example. And uh, typically, I would click OK. 
but I can't find my OK button <laughs> on the screen right now. So uh, I will cheat that much. And I've read, I, this was a Boyd's implementation I just did last night, you know, because all the presentations were just so cool that I just have to do something more cool <laughs> than a simple example. And if I right click this and come down to type properties, I'll show you the code here. So the code in here actually implements Boyd's, the flocking algorithm. Uh, really all it does at the bottom here is it instantiates the class and then it does move, move Boyd's. So it just moves the points. Um, if you start playing it, let me visualize it here. you're going to see that it doesn't seem to work. And uh, one of the reasons is because uh, in this context, when every time Houdini um, cooks through the network, it only remembers what is happening on that frame itself. It has no uh, memory of what was going on in the previous frame. But when you want to implement a, like a, a solver or a Boyd's kind of solution, you need to know what was the velocity of um, your Boyd in the previous frame, right? So we have a little thing called um, a solver node, which if you connect in here, all it does is if you double click and go into here, it will uh, it will actually remember the state of something in the previous frame. So if you could just go in and connect another Boyd's Python node to it, I think that might work. Attribute error, blah, blah, blah. All right. So for the sake of brevity and because we don't have time to troubleshoot this, I'm going to open up what I have already done. Yep. And the, the good thing about Houdini is that you can actually download what they call the apprentice uh, version, which is uh, free. Uh, it has everything that the master version has. The only limitation is that uh, it renders with a watermark and it's uh, got a maximum resolution of I think 640 by 480. Um, so it's good for student work and if you happen to want to do it for some amateur enthusiast work for example say you could buy the H Apprentice HD which I think lets you render up to 1280 um, sort of resolution and that's like 99 bucks for a year. It's, it, it beats the $5,000 price tag for the master license um, a lot. So over here, um, let me try and bring this here so that it's clearer. Um, Just run it. I want to see it go. <laughs> sure. Scene view. So if I were to just run it. Um, this play. So it's it's cooking. It's simulating. So it, it takes a while first, but I still think it's not too bad. So it's calling the move points like every frame. Every frame. So in here, I have about two hundred and forty frames. And uh, and it's doing it for each and every Boyd. So I guess uh, based on some of the functional programming stuff, maybe you could some of these things could be useful. Or if you wanted to use PyCuda, you could get the GPU to calculate each of this because it's very discrete. Um, and the cool thing about Houdini is you can also so once it's done it once, you know, it's 
super fast. Yeah, it it's cached, and you can get it to um, display. For example, say uh, if you don't want points, you can display lines, and then I think that will save as default. And I think that will give you like the velocity maybe. Hmm. Yeah. No, just says it's successful. Only new viewports. Ah, okay. So only new viewports. So let's see. Plus a new scene view. Nope. <laughs> yeah. It didn't affect it. But yeah, I mean, so essentially, you know, you, you could use it to write almost anything that you wanted to. And the great part about it is because of, of Python integration, you can uh, use it to call different Python libraries. And I think that's a great help, especially in the visual effects industry, where you can use like NumPy, SciPy to do some of that stuff. And some of the machine learning stuff that, you know, was presented was also pretty cool. So, uh, you typically you would you you would export this as if you've got the full version, you can export it as a dot mov straight out, or you could of course always export it as uh, frames like exrs, jpegs, and then, and then um, yeah them into an image so yeah so one of the good things about uh, Houdini is the side effects website is extremely good with documentation uh, you could basically learn it from the start on the side effects website so feel free to um, go in and browse uh, if you're really interested in specifically Python and how it's used in Houdini they have a master class called Python uh, Python Houdini Masterclass. Uh, it's online. Uh, it's available in a three-part video. I think it's almost four or four hours long. <laughs> so, but it's got some pretty cool stuff in there. So, uh, yeah. So, I guess okay. if anyone has questions, nope. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>